All right. You got your decision to make right now, Simon. You've got like 10 seconds. Man on the side or my stupid mouth. All right. Man on the side. Let's do it. Okay. Uh, you want me to watch this top video? Wait, so this is John Mayer singing it. All right, cool. Let's listen to the beginning. I love how he hits like that E there. I think he's implying the B minor pentatonic, but he hits like this E, this like a... Bringing out this like E, e major pentatonic. Sorry, I just got sidetracked. Sometimes when I hear songs, I want to hear, I get inspired by like the vibe of what he's doing. You Like he's just comping on his vibe. Lewis, what's up? How you doing? So he's comping on this vibe. And so one thing I want to try and figure out is like, how is he getting this, this solo groove? Um, getting like a like a suspended E chord is that what he's doing there? yeah nah. Where are you 
duet. Uh, uh, uh. that it's, it's like a major pentatonic in the E so it's so so you're singing in the major pentatonic so you're going third five six root in the E major that's what that lick is yeah, I think you're just playing. Like, I think that's what he just did. He just added the Layla lick. I was just trying to figure out how he's getting there. Like, how is he thinking? why this is fun. So the the beginning part here of what he's doing, a oh man on the side. I think he's just sitting on an E, which is the one, and then he's going to the six, which is going to be the C sharp minor, and then he's dropping down to the B, which is five, and then the four, which is the A, back to the B. Gets to the next part here. So just a two, five. Could 
you pencil me in when you care. I think he moves up to a four there. Is that what he does there? Could you pencil me in when No, I'm playing the wrong chords. It makes sense if it was a three. So cool. Could you pencil me in when you can? Though we both know that the one. Though we both know. Worst part of. Two to a six. About it. If you want him uh. If you want him This is cool. When you wanted me, if you wanted me. Simon, are you still here? Checking in. Ooh, I just got a notification that my thing disconnected. Let me know if I have not disconnected for you in the chat. <laughs> oh, you still here? Okay, cool, sweet. <laughs> I literally had OBS just went onto my screen and was like, you have disconnected. We are reconnecting now. And I was like, oh, classic. This is what happens to Australian, is it?
That's very cool. Doing the classic one, two, four, five. It's so crazy how he just gets such basic chord progressions that have been really, really successful in the past. And then he just like John Mayer's the fuck out of them and makes them work so... They just feel like you haven't really heard that kind of progression. It's so cool. We'll swallow his pride. Life as the like that chord. Where the fuck did that come from? Life as the man. That girl, Carly, what's up? The man on the side. Like that. Life as the man on. Nice. So he's doing like a six. Like a flat seven. I know, right? It, it honestly, it is a thing. It, it's not like a, no, I'm not fucking making this up, right? His OG stuff is so like, it's, he's, he's doing so many things that you're like, yeah, like that's, that sounds good. He's like, he's playing the same chord progressions that we've heard in millions of pop songs. And then he's doing like the fucking coolest things. Like who drops that? Like, who drops that kind of chord right there? Life the like uh, any pop person, right? I mean, then again, there's a reason why these songs aren't hits. Uh, some of these songs aren't like massive, like gigantic hits. They're like the cult ones that we love as John Mayer fans. Um, they're not designed. They're not like a... But even on that song, he drops into the... When he gets to that bridge, he drops into the, the four minor. It's a, it's a like, that's a pop song that was massively successful. And he just hit like this fucking, he, he straight up swapped us into um, G minor or G Dorian. And he swaps you into that in the bridge. And it's like, He's, he's one of these guys that you can just, one of these musicians that just absolutely slays. Like, who can, I don't hear that often. You just, very rarely do you hear it. Maybe they'll drop a chord in, but he did a, like, in a pop song, he totally just drops you in to G Dorian. Like, that's just so... Like, what the fuck, man? Like, like his level of chord knowledge and 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 I and he always he's like, oh, I don't know, I don't know. It's like, fuck off, John Man, you know. <laughs> I think he, his one is like he knows, but he knows that if he says it, then he isn't. He has a chance to incriminate himself against like the nerds. So I think for him, he like explains it. And he's like. Well, I don't really like know the right way to say it. He hundred percent always knows what he's talking about. He's like, I don't know the right way to say it, but like I'm kind of like seeing like these colors, and I was like, you're not seeing colors. You know exactly where you're going, and you know exactly how to get what you what you're after. He knows exactly what he's doing. I'm telling you right now, no one playing like this does not know what they're doing. But but he's very clever because he's not going to be like, so this is the the note in this key involved. Like he doesn't. He's never going to go and say all those things because he knows some fucking nerd is going to jump in and be like, that's not the right chord and blah, blah, blah. And then they're going to be like, <laughs> they're going to be like, that's not the right thing. This is the, the fucking blah, blah, blah. And then he'll be like, you totally missed the point. So he's actually like 200 IQing it for us. Oh, you've seen the clip? Yeah. Like, fuck off. I, 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 I am... He is way too good for him to be like, it's just colors. I'm like, no, man, it's not just colors. 
It's because you practice the shit out of this and you know exactly what you're talking about and you're very, very good. Um, like there's nothing about that. There's nothing in there that's like, I am the one who will swallow his pride. Life as the man on. And like, look, look at this. He goes, his, the line is life on the man on the side. Like, ready? Life on the man on the side. He drops down to a flat 7-7. Seven, seven. No, he doesn't do just a flat seven. He's just doing the triad. Life as a man on the side. He's literally playing a chord that's on the side. It's like, this is where your root note is. And he plays one, it's just a, a step down, flat seven, which is modal interchange, right? Life as a man on the side. Like, the chord's on the side. It's like right on the side of, of the key. And the, and the lyric is, Life is a man on the side. Like, fucking... And when you know his, like, background of him studying under Pat Patterson and understanding prosody and things need to work together, like, he didn't casually just be like, you know, that sounds kind of cool. He's like, no, I'm about to sing Life as Man on the Side. And so... Life is man on the side. So it's like, you know, it's weird being the man on the side, but he resolves to man on the side at the end. And it makes you feel weird. It makes you feel uncomfortable. Because he's giving you the... I am the one who will swallow his pride. I am the one who will swallow his pride. So he's literally playing the My Girl, which is one, two, four, five. Life is a man on the side. Like, that is so good. That is some fucking god tier writing. I mean, for music nerds, it's god tier writing. For a pop song, it's not that good. But, um, you know, I don't think he wrote the song to make it a hit. The man on the side. I'm late for this. Dude, it doesn't matter. It, do, you know, do you know what? I'm, like, this is the thing, right? Okay, it depends. Simon, are you trying to be famous at the same time as him? Like, even he says this was an anomaly. You know, I think it's the perfect storm of time where he was at and what he was doing. You know, like, he used to just breathe music. Like, this is all he did. He would go to sleep listening to great music. And they, he wasn't watching, he wasn't playing video games. He just fucking played, played, and he wrote, and he wrote, and he played, and he wrote, and he played, and he wrote, and that's all he did. That's how you get this good. And you do that on hours, and you have a feedback loop of people around you that are really, really good. You just get insanely good. Like, how did he get so... You just look at John, like reverse, John, reverse engineer John Mayer, right? Clay Cook is the guy who he hung out with all the time, and he like left Berkeley to go with. He had Toma Fujita as his guitar teacher. He had Pat Patterson as a lyric writing professor. He's at Berkeley, the place where everyone's writing. He is just smashing it. And then he goes to Atlanta and he moves to Atlanta and he's hanging out with people like David Ryan Harris and that whole community of musicians that are that good hanging out in Atlanta. That's the people he's hanging out with. That's who he's learning from. That's how he's improving. And then once he goes to his second album, you pro he probably did. Um, I think him and Clay Cook, they wrote heaps of songs together. But the, um, like, every time, like, this is the same thing with, like, Taylor Swift, right? They upskilled by, like, who's the band that he, who is the guy who plays drums and plays bass for him and records his album for Continuum and records, like, the John Mayer Trio stuff? Steve Jordan and Pino Palladino. Literally the two of the biggest heavyweights of music of all time. Like some of the 
the the musicians that are around John Mayer's like thing. Like he was so clever. He wasn't like, oh yeah, it's me and my buddies from school. You know, it was like, no, I'm gonna grab like the best bass player that I love and best session player. Like he literally looked at the credits on the albums of he of the songs he loved, and those are the people that played on his records. Those are the people that got in the room with him. Those are the people that he got to like extract information from, sit in the studio, jamming, writing, coming up with tones, coming up with, with vibes. Like um, he has great knowledge of chords, but Pino Palladino was the one who sat with him talking about um, fucking, I'm pretty sure this was, I only say this because I heard him say it in an interview, but I'm pretty sure Pino Palladino was the one who co-wrote um, Stop this train. I don't know if it's an actual credit. Is did he credit Pino on it? Yeah, he credited Pino on it. Boom. Like everyone's like, oh my god, John Mayer wrote like this amazing and he did write these amazing lyrics. But Pino Palladino is the one who helped him figure out all the chords. Pino Palladino is the one's like, yeah, this is where you can go with it. This is how you can like voice lead it really well, blah, blah, blah. They co-wrote this. Like all the chords that you're hearing, that's because he's got one of the best bassists in the world. One of the best, not bassists, best musicians in the world in his corner. How can you not be that fucking good when you're, and this is the thing, like, I mean, it goes back to coaching and learning and all this stuff. When you're trying to learn anything in, in any skill, if you can fucking cut, like basically the biggest hack on learning is finding someone who's 20 times better than you, paying them and learning from them as fast as you fucking can. And then as soon as you get everything you want out of that person, go to the next one and just keep leveling up and leveling up and then you will get good so fast. But that's what John Mayer did. He didn't, there's no magic formula. It's literally, he worked super fucking hard and where everyone would just like sit in their own space, he was always upskilling his ability. And the same thing happened with Ed Sheeran. The same thing happened with Taylor Swift. The same thing you watch Benson. You watch all of these insane musicians. They all do the same thing. The only problem that happens with it is typically when musicians or just in general anyone has success, as soon as they have success, they suffer the problem of second order consequences, which is like, I write a great album. Now I'm spending heaps of time promoting the album. Now I'm time touring the album, going to a bunch of all those other things. Like they're doing so many things that aren't doing the music and then that puts them behind. But that's why, you know, there's a cycle of musicians. You know, the musicians come in and then they do really well. And then by the time it gets to their second album, they don't do that well. Um, they're not as good. They just kind of like float around and then, they're sp then they have to, then the problem, this is, and it gets even worse. It compounds, right? So this is how it gets even worse. This is like the demise of an artist, right? It's like, not demise, it's such a bad, <laughs> such a doom and gloom. But basically, artist comes out with the first album. They spent so much time building it up, working on their craft, honing their craft. They do their first album. They get signed. They get all this fucking shit thrown at them. They're like, this is the promo tour. This is this, this is this. They're waking up at 5 a.m., flying, doing red eyes, going to like fucking every like six radio shows a day doing whatever the crazy bullshit is. I used to watch my friends who were signed on uh, some major labels and they would be out partying with us at like 11, 12 a.m. And then they're like, all right, guys, I got to go to bed because I got to wake up at 5.30 in the morning because I got a radio interview in fucking Chicago or bullshit, whatever they had to do. Like, fuck, it's so hard. Like, so, so hard. Now, how the shit, how the hell do you go from doing that for like a year because as soon as you're doing that for like a year when you look at a band that's touring or an artist that's touring they're doing interviews they're going doing a bunch of shit and they're like they're performing when they're performing they do sound check and they perform and then they have all this time in between they have that gets filled with shit like interviews doing all that stuff how are they going to write a great album it's so rare that you get musicians that come in and then they can actually be focused and they can actually push it and they can actually keep doing their craft and keep grinding. It's really, really, really hard. Um, so that's one thing. And, but then that, so then they spend less time working on the second album and then, <laughs> yeah, it really isn't. It's super fucking hard, especially in that, 
in that space. Because for everyone who's in the music industry, um, like when you are an artist, like, yeah, a lot of people are like, oh, I want to be famous. I want to do this. Like, yeah, but you got to remember that there's a bunch of people not making quota. So a record deal is not a record deal. A record deal is not you making it. A record deal is a fucking loan. They're basically, all right, we're going to advance you this much money um, and you're going to see none of it till you recoup on your album. And you have no say on where they put the advertising dollars. They could just say, hey, we think a million dollars on Facebook ads is like banger or they'll make a banner. Like they'll put a fucking billboard up and they're like, this is totally going to convert sales on your album. It's like, you have no fucking clue. I worked in marketing for a, a distributing company and, you know, they love their their artists, but... Do you know what the fucking marketing template was? It was the fucking same thing for every single artist. They didn't even do anything to change. In fact, they would spend... I remember we, we, we had a budget of like, I think it was 10 grand to put up a fucking billboard for an artist that just put up their album just so that when the artist was in town, they could see the billboard up when they drove in and they could see it and they're like, oh my God, this is so cool. I'm on a billboard so they can get the photo. And that was the fucking only reason they did it. There was no way that that $10,000 was spent that was going to earn more money. It was literally to stroke egos to make sure that that artist didn't drop the distribution company. That was it. There was no other fucking reason. And, we, and people in that space, the, the marketing guys in that space are encouraging people to click on ads they're encouraging their team. So obviously, say I was doing the ad for like the release campaign of like Tyler Childers or something like that. And I'm doing that and I'm being told, yeah, you should click on this ad. Every time I click on that ad, I'm getting served that ad because I'm taught, like I'm literally doing all the shit for him. So like my personal account stuff will be like, hey, we see you're engaging a lot of Tyler Childers. You're looking at his stuff. So we, here you go. Here's the ad. And... um <laughs> They're like, click it, because if I click it, then it increases impressions and it, click, and it increases click-through rate. Um, but it costs the artist money every time I click, you know? And it's not training a fucking great algorithm or anything like that. I don't know, maybe they're 200 IQ, but I just saw it as wasting money because I'm not someone who's going to buy the album. And that is the fucking music industry. So, like, these artists come in, they don't know where the money's going. They don't know what they're, they're being told by record labels. This is what you have to do because it has worked in the past for others. And then you've got like 80% of them losing money. So like say for instance, you get to the second album. If your first album didn't recoup, your second album, they're about to put a million or $2 million into you to try and sell that album. And if you don't recoup the second album, which chances are you probably won't if you didn't recoup the first one because now you're just going to have to spend more time advertising rather than creating a product that just sells. So one of the, the greatest things that you'll ever hear John Mayer say, and he's fucking right when he says it, they're like, there's this girl who says, how do I market my CD? And how do I market my album? She's like, I just recorded this album. I'm going to do this, blah, blah, blah. And she's like, how do I market it? And he's like, write a good song. You're going to have all these fucking gurus in the music industry being like, do this, do this, do this, do this, do this, do this. And <laughs> the fucking thing is just have a good product and that's it. And it's crazy that that's the most overlooked thing when it comes to music. Ah, blows my fucking mind. Anyway, long story short, just practice heaps, write a good song and don't stop practicing once you make it. And then you shall kill it. So Simon, if you ever become famous, that will be the only way. I'm telling you right now, if you want to be like John Mayer, that's it. You just practice every single day, five to 10 hours a day, and you do that for like three or four years and you will get really, really good. One of the many, one of the few To stand back and wait for you Excuse me, Mrs. Busybody could you pass on me when you can? Though we both know that the worst part about it is I. Yeah, I can't, I can't help you out with that one, Adam. I don't know how TikTok sucks.
TikTok studio is garbage, but everyone on YouTube is not having a problem. I'm sorry. I wish I could help you out with that. It's just when I hear the tracks, it does the thing. <laughs> sorry, I love the mini pep talks. Yeah, I get really into it. I fucking love this stuff. This stuff is like the stuff that I nerd out on. But... <laughs> I'm sorry, Adam. I wish I was. Anyway, so you were talking about man on the side. Um, they shove reality up your ass. <laughs> anyway, just let's let's just end this um, man on the side because I I kind of just been doing this and I want to sing some more songs before I have to go. I have to leave, but but basically, if we're just going to chat about men on the side, he's just vibing in the key of E. He's doing an E, C sharp, and then he's dropping down to the B, down to the A, which is really cool. So if you're going to jam on the verse parts and you want to fill it, you got your minor pentatonic right here on the C sharp. And you're just going to do little sneaky things where you can just like fill in. And then when you get to these parts, which is going to be the, the B and the, uh, the A chord, just do your E shape try from the cage system. Just bring your third finger down. And then you just kind of like fill with your pinky. And if you want to do like a major pentatonic, you can fit the major pentatonic on the four chord. You do that one for the five chord, which is the B, and then on the A... And you can do that. You can do that there on the four chord. And then when he does that two chord. You can just pretty much vamp on the 2-5. So he does the E to the um, F sharp minor, A to a B. So that's just a 1, 2, 4, 5, which is uh, my girl. And then when he does the, and he wants to do the turnaround back into the into the verse, he'll do a flat seven, which is a D chord, and then an A to the E. So doing flat seven, four, one. It's pretty cool. I like it. It's a nice song. Look at the solo he does. Whereabouts is that? Good luck to you. Is that where it's at? Is this what you're talking about, uh, Simon? Oh, maybe 
this like second inversion one chord. Doctor, we'll chat you soon. Thank you for hanging out with us. Is that what you were asking for, uh, Simon? Is that what you're talking about? That you were like, what's he doing there? That's pretty simple stuff. He's just in a one. And he's just doing this nice little melody run. It's very cool. All right, I'm done with this. I'm done with that jam. I'm going to play some music. I've got.